Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2016, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the State House of Representatives District 10A debate. Your moderator tonight is Ray Gildow. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Debate 2016, 11 state legislative debates over four nights. The uh, debate for this hour period is the House 10A. Our candidates for this evening are Quinn Nystrom, who is the Democratic uh, Farmer Labor Party candidate, and Josh Heinzman, who is the Rep Republican uh, candidate and the incumbent. Uh, our panel who are, will be asking us questions this evening are Dennis Wyman, the Lakeland Public Television News Director, Zach Kaiser, Brainerd Dispatch News Writer, and Heidi Holton, News and Public Affairs Director, for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE. I'd like to read the rules just so everybody's on the same page. Each candidate will get a three minute opening period and the panel will ask questions after the opening comments. Some will be their own questions and some will be questions that they've received from the public. Each candidate will get two minutes to answer the question and each candidate will have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. And I might add, it doesn't have to be a rebuttal, it might just be that you thought of something else to add. So I don't feel it has to be a rebuttal. And new this year, exciting and new, is each candidate will have the option of using one minute bonus of time if you'd like to add on to something you'd answered. And this can be used at any period or any time during this 50 minute period. Uh, questions continue until we get about 50 minutes into the hour period, which time we will stop and go to the closing comments. So um, we will begin with the opening comments and we will start out with Mr. Heinzman. Thank you. Um, really thankful to be here tonight. Uh, as was just mentioned, I'm Josh Heinzman. I'm the state representative in Crow Wing County. And I'm really grateful that you're here tonight to watch tonight's debate and to hear a little bit more about myself and, and to hear about uh, the other candidates' positions on issues. Some of my background, when I was just a year old, my folks came to the Lakes area, so that's 1978, and I've grown up in the family business. It's called Upcountry Log. We do log railings and trusses and stair systems columns, even some post and beam work, some custom sawmill work. So the whole gamut in the wood industry there, I guess. I'm a hunter, a fisherman, snowmobiler, ATV enthusiast, bicyclist, runner, business owner, a man of faith and family. I'm living in what a lot of folks have, I think, uh, coined accurately the most recreationally diverse county in the entire state. I'm endorsed by the NRA, MCCL, that's Minnesota Concerned Citizens for Life, Farm Bureau, NFIB, Minnesota Care Providers, and the Minnesota Chamber, just to name a few. My family has been so blessed to serve in House District 10A and we continue to look forward to the opportunity to possibly continue to do so. I have a little bit of time left, so I'm just gonna quickly mention something. I thought I might not, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it just, I guess, for fun. Some uh, Heinzman trivia. Um, and I didn't share this the last go around, but um, I will this time. Uh, three things, I guess. Uh, number one, kind of a fun thing, Carrie and I, um, we met years ago, and she's the only girl I've ever kissed. We've been married 17 years and now have six children. Um, this one, I, I hesitate. This is probably the reason I hesitate the most, but I've never tasted a beer. And as a politician, there's some good and bad to that. The good, of course, is you quite often see politicians in situations they probably shouldn't have been and probably wouldn't have if they had all their wits about them. So that's one way that I can avoid a lot of the difficulties maybe that folks might face in St. Paul. I've also never had a speeding ticket and uh, I don't know, it just seems a lot easier as a family guy to avoid those kind of difficult situations that you find people in alongside the highway. So that's a little bit about me, some background. Thank you. Ms. Nystrom. My name is Quinn Nystrom. Um, I'm a lifelong resident uh, of the Brainerd Lakes area. Uh, I'm a fourth generation uh, to live here. My journey probably to get to this seat tonight started 20 years ago when I was a 10 year old girl and I found out that my younger brother had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. It set me on a course to want to be a strong advocate for him, for others who I had met who were also struggling with a chronic incurable illness. 
Uh, I never knew that two and a half years later, I would also be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, instead of uh, being sad and in denial and angry about it, I was able to overcome it with the help of family and friends um, and a wonderful nonprofit called the American Diabetes Association. And so I decided sometimes the only choice you get is how you're going to react to things in life. And so that set me on a course uh, to want to not only go around our own community, but around the state and our country to advocate for topics that were very important to me that I saw needed a strengthened voice. And so um, through that time, I've been able to raise thousands of dollars for diabetes. Um, I've been able to shine the light on uh, the stories that I've seen so many people struggle with. And so a couple years ago, I decided that I would run for the Baxter City Council where I serve currently. I've enjoyed that time on a nonpartisan council to meet with citizens and business owners um, to help them come in the middle to find common solutions for everybody that would work. And so I'm running for the Minnesota House 10A seat uh, because I believe we need the strength and voice. Uh, we need to work on all sides to make sure that we continue to keep moving Minnesota forward. Uh, things that have always been important to me are affordable health care, um, strong roads and bridges, um, and also a strong public education system. Um, I was a Brainerd graduate, and I believe that public education um, is a bedrock for our futures. So thank you so much. Thank you. Our first question will come from Zach Kaiser, and it will be directed towards Ms. Nystrom. Which presidential candidate do you support and why? I think that's uh, been a hard question for a lot of people to answer this year. It's something that, uh, you know, I think there were a lot of candidates that started, uh, especially on the Republican side. Um, but given uh, a lot of the comments uh, and video that have come out here in the last couple of weeks, um, I believe that the, the number one thing for a leader is to be a role model for people, to be respectful, um, to have ears to listen to everybody. Um, and I don't believe that Donald Trump does that. So unfortunately, though I'm not really enthusiastic about either candidate, I will not be casting my ballot for Donald Trump, um, and I'll be voting for Hillary Clinton this year. But I also think it's important to note that uh, I think it's disheartening to see the lack of civility in politics right now. And uh, regardless of who anybody votes for or supports, uh, you know, I'm particularly passionate about getting young people involved in the political process. And I believe unless we encourage people and say it's okay to be tolerant of a differing viewpoint, uh, we won't have uh, younger people and maybe people who wouldn't be particularly interested in running for office to be so disheartened that they'll never run um, because they see how negative it is. Thank you. Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> Yeah, this is one that you hear people struggling with this question uh, at a lot of different levels. And I'll be real honest, I'm an issues voter. Uh, when issues come to the legislature, I want to know the facts. I want to understand the impacts all the way around an issue. And for me, really, this comes back to that same sort of process. What are the impacts going to be here uh, in our state and across the country? And some of those issues that are incredibly important to me are, are like the, for example, the issue of life. Uh, Hillary Clinton is ardently supportive in uh, the use of taxpayer dollars for abortion. I can't support that. And in the case of Mr. Trump, he's pro-life. Another big issue that I am, uh, I think, very carefully contemplating the impacts from both candidates on is the issue of Second Amendment in our courts. Uh, the Supreme Court is a huge part of this conversation, and uh, the next president will likely select as many, three, four, maybe more uh, Supreme Court judges. So on the issue of life, on the issue of Second Amendment, I absolutely cannot support Hillary Clinton. I have to support Trump, no question. Thank you. Any additional comments? Well, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, I think it's tough when somebody has not held a publicly elected position. We don't know exactly how they may vote or um, what they may say and then vote a different way once they're elected into office. So to me, that is uh, one of the more scarier points about Donald Trump is he may say things, but we don't know um, exactly how he would vote. 
And with the Supreme Court justice thing, um, though they appoint it, there's a checks and balance system, and the Senate would have to approve uh, whoever that appointee is. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Any other comments there? Yeah, absolutely, I do. I think my opponent makes a great point. And uh, the fact is, Hillary does have a track record. And if you go uh, back 30 years on to today, present day, uh, we have a track record of a person that is not honest, a person that cannot be trusted, issue after issue. Our military and other folks uh, are in harm's way constantly. How can we be sure that this particular person, and I've heard this at door after door, is going to be there for our military, be there for seniors, be there for middle class? Okay, thank you. Question will be in Mr. Wyman, and he will direct his question to Mr. Heinzman. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, and, and Mr. Heinzman, you addressed this briefly a little bit in your last comment, but I'd like maybe you to expand a little bit and also uh, give both candidates a chance to answer this. Uh, taxpayers have funded more than 73,000 abortions at a cost of $22.5 million, according to a report from the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Do you support using taxpayer money for abortions in Minnesota? How would you vote? Absolutely not. I do not using taxpayer dollars to support abortion. Uh, this is an issue that um, a lot of greater Minnesota candidates wind up agreeing on. And that's because across greater Minnesota, the vast majority of folks are pro-life. And I think it's a very significant difference between um, what you're capable to accomplish as a legislator as a Republican or as a Democrat. And as a Republican, I know when I go to St. Paul that those same values that I have and that my constituents have on this issue are gonna be supported by my leadership and by my party. Parties have all kinds of issues and I get that. You hear that from voters all the time. Party politics can be a really frustrating uh, conversation. But on issues like pro-life and on the Second Amendment, I know that my party will have my back on this particular uh, concern. Thank you, Ms. Nystrom. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, I was raised uh, a couple miles from here in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, being an evangelical Christian, uh, attending church weekly, I'm a member here at a church in Baxter as an active member. My faith is important to me. Um, uh, I've always been pro-life. I have not moved my stance on that. I believe in the sanctity of life. Um, I've fought for life, uh, and to me, and what I've looked at statistics is actually one in three Minnesotans who are Democrats are pro-life, and so uh, I don't believe that I answer to the Democratic Party at the end of the day. I answer to the constituents in District 10A, and um, you know, when you're asking me my personal opinion on that specific issue, that's my personal opinion. I also know meeting with a lot of people door to door, um, this is a hot topic, um, but I do believe, like my opponent, there's a lot of people, especially in rural Minnesota, I think, with strong, rooted values in Christianity, uh, believe in the sanctity of life and being pro-life. Thank you. Any follow-up on that, mm -hmm. Mr. Heinzman? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I would quickly bring up in my follow-up, um, if you look at the dispatch in 1990, the front page, during that year's Walk for Life, I'm there. I'm on the front page. I'm the marcher leading the pack. Um, my credentials on this issue go way back. And it's not simply a situation where now I'm uh, having to run for office and uh, I need that in order to be a candidate that has a chance in a greater Minnesota district. Thank you. Ms. Nystrom, any follow up on that? What I would say is um, for me to have a chance to win this race has nothing to do with me being pro-life on this issue. I don't believe that people vote just based on one issue and one issue only. I also have never changed my stance on this. So, um, and I didn't grow up saying, oh, I'm gonna be state representative and now this year I've decided I need to think a certain way on this issue. Um, I am who I am uh, and um, the people who, know me and have helped raise me in this community, um, know that I've always uh, stood that way on that issue. I have to take my yes, go ahead. All right. 
Um, the reason I brought that up is, is important. And, and number one, I would lead with, I guess, um, I am endorsed by MCCL. And that's not an easy endorsement to get. Um, in spite of my lifelong work on uh, issues relating to life and pro-life, I didn't get that endorsement the first time. And I have it now. And like I said, there is a reason for that because of our work on legislative issues specifically dealing with the issue of life this last session. One of the bills that we passed and I was a part of and I co-authored was a bill that uh, prohibited clinics from discarding a human life who, may, who happened to be the victim of a botched abortion. You wouldn't think that would ever be an issue, but it was right here in Minnesota and we passed legislation that prohibited doctors and nurses involved in an abortion from simply throwing that life in with the rest of the medical waste. And it's, it's critical that we maintain uh, that pro-life attitude in this district. Thank you. Okay, our next question is coming from Heidi Holton and it will be directed to Ms. Nystrom. <clears throat> our medical system is prepared to treat people that have something like cancer or other serious health conditions. It's not as true about mental illness. Um, how could it be better? Great question. I think we have a long ways to go um, until we are at a place where we are uh, effectively uh, treating this crisis in our community. Um, I know right here in Crow Wing County, uh, one in four people uh, say that they suffer with some type of mental illness. And um, after I was elected to the Baxter City Council, um, uh, the Baxter mayor put me on the Baxter Community Behavioral Health Hospital. Uh, advisory board and so we meet quarterly and to me what is so sad um, is that here we have after a lot of our large state hospitals were closed we have a 16 bed facility here in Baxter to help people um, who are really struggling with serious mental illnesses and we have not had the funding to put people in all 16 beds um, because the lack of funding that we've had and so um, to me we need to ensure that we increase that funding, we increase those resources, that we look at how can we effectively treat people with a mental illness. But I think secondly, we also have to look at as a community, as a state, as a country, how do we uh, decrease the shame that is often associated with living with a mental illness? Uh, you know, people will say, well, you have type one diabetes. A lot of people don't question you having it or you don't have to be embarrassed to say you have it. But with a mental illness, oftentimes I think it is silenced. People don't feel comfortable getting the help or the treatment that they are in need of because they're nervous, will jeopardize uh, their position with their employer, will their friends or family make fun of them. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're opening communication, uh, that we're saying it's okay, that this is a common thing to struggle with, and to look at creative ways uh, that we can come together as a community um, to make sure that these people are getting the help that they need. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> My background, as I mentioned earlier, is I'm a carpenter. And so coming to the legislature, there was a, a, quite a, a process of getting up to speed on issues. And one of those issues is mental health. I've been so grateful for the community folks that have taken the opportunity or the time to invite me in and to learn more about uh, the challenges that we face here in Crow Wing County, whether it was meeting with officials at Essentia Health and the challenge that they have, or even uh, recently I invited uh, Speaker Doubt to come with me as I had been invited to visit Nystrom and Associates and to tour their facility and hear from them first and foremost, you know, what is happening boots on the ground and the challenges that they face. I continue to uh, listen and to work on this issue uh, over the last biennium, there was a huge need that was seen in uh, our nursing home care and facilities across the state. And we invested over $230 million. Just over $2 million of that came right here to Crow Wing County to help our nursing homes. This is a situation that needs attention, and I believe we'll get that attention this coming session. Thank you. Ms. Nystrom, any additional comments? I think it's certainly, uh, if I was elected, uh, it would be a huge priority of mine um, 
because especially we see it here in Crow Wing County. Um, you know, when I saw the Crow Wing County Energize survey come back, uh, one in four people, you know, this is an issue that affects so many people in our community. And so to me, we need to put those resources to make sure that we are back at full capacity uh, at our community behavioral health hospitals. Okay, thank you. Mr. Heitzman, any additional comments? Uh, just actually the last week that we've been visiting with people from NAMI and other organizations, uh, one of the conversations that I was around that I really appreciated was the discussion around uh, more community involvement, church involvement, and other civic organizations in Crow Wing County and what they're doing to help people because mental health isn't an issue that's going away. It's something that we're going to be dealing with for a long time and I wish that I could say we're seeing a decline, but we're not. We're seeing an uptick and there's reasons for that. And part of our responsibility as a legislator is to not just address the symptoms, but also find some of the causations. What are the reasons for the change that we've been encountering and watching, not just happening in Minnesota, but across the entire country? And the investment uh, that can be made there, I think, is important. Thank you. The next question is from Zach Kaiser, and it will be directed to Ms. He or Mr. Heinzman. What's the most pressing, pressing issue in higher education other than student debt and tuition? Other than student debt, because that's honestly uh, what you're going to hear almost constantly when you visit with people is the issue of uh, tuition and such. Um, honestly, I guess, as a, here again, a builder, I think that so often folks are kids, are uh, brought up maybe thinking that the only option for them is uh, a four-year degree or maybe even beyond. And uh, the word needs to get out. We need people at every level. We need kids that are thinking about, you know, plumbing. We're think needs to get thinking about road work. We need th people that are thinking about um, maybe working in a nursing home environment or whatever the case. These aren't, uh, these degrees don't require a, a four-year uh, time. And, uh, you know, that's, that's probably a, a challenge that we're going to face. Um, over the next few years as we need to meet the need in those particular jobs and industries. Uh, something that I was able to work on and I'm really proud of in the Min State program, which you might have uh, heard or thought of as um, MinSKU, is now changed to Min State, is an open source textbook bill, which I'm super happy about. We're helping to fund that and encourage uh, the Min State programs and, and campuses to utilize that. That gives students access to an open source book at no cost that can be edited and can be um, updated through the entire process, through the entire school uh, semester process, and then it's there and ready for another uh, group of folks to utilize. Books can cost a ton of money. Um, 100 bucks, 150 bucks is not uncommon, and I have a stack of those in my closet, like most people do, and uh, that was a great opportunity to work on something that maybe is a little off the radar. Thank you. Ms. Nystrom? Mm -mm. I think one of the big um, crises that we see in higher education um, is, and actually I see this in my day job, I do public relations uh, for a healthcare organization here in our community. And I know right now we are struggling um, to recruit uh, people just coming out of medical school, um, family care physicians, uh, LPNs, uh, paramedics. Um, we are unable to fill those positions and, um, you know, those three positions in particular, that's a varying kind of different types um, being part of our educational system. So to me, with higher education, we need to see, um, okay, so it's 2016, where are our workforce shortages? Where are there the most job openings? Because I think a lot of people um, in college, and I know when I first started, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to go into. I didn't know, did I want to go to law school? Did I want to stay in communications? Um, was this four-year college thing a good fit for me? And so I think as a higher ed community, if we talk to students about, and again, I think this changes year after year about what our needs are um, as a society, but what are those jobs right out of school where you could get a good paying job, where there are companies who are 
I'm going to give you a, a signing bonus because they are so in need of your talents. And so I think if we can be proactive by saying, you know, these are some great industries to go into, uh, we really need a lot of people, um, I think that that would really help a lot of students right after they graduate, make sure they're going right into their professional career, um, making good jobs and um, coming into society. Thank you. Mr. Heitzman, any additional comments there? Yeah, just a uh, just an additional thing that was uh, that struck me as we were talking a little bit more about this. Uh, we do have some great systems and programs in place to currently help students. Um, I'm a Minsku graduate. Um, I graduated with my AA in business management right here at the Central Lakes College campus, um, and I did that as a post-secondary student. What a great opportunity for kids, underutilized, and I think that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really special, unique program. It was brought to Minnesota, and uh, the very first state to utilize it. That was cutting edge then, and I hope that we can continue to work on things like that and provide opportunities for kids that you might not find anywhere else in the country. Thank you, Ms. Nystrom. Any additional comments? When I was at Brainerd High School, I got to take a couple classes uh, and was also a PSEO student at CLC. Um, and I think for students who are looking at how do I fund my, you know, uh, future education, it's an excellent option. It's also an excellent option to give them a taste of maybe uh, different areas that they want to go to um, in the future. So I think we absolutely need to support uh, that area and those opportunities for our area students. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Mr. Wyman and it will be directed towards Ms. Nystrom. What can be done at the state legislature to help reinvigorate the economy in this part of the state? Well, I think number one is um, making sure uh, that at the state legislature that uh, bonding and tax bills are being passed. Um, I know sitting on the city council, um, you know, when we have a session where a bonding bill is not passed like this last year, um, there are local road projects that we had tied up in that. And so when we were expecting to get the construction vehicles out to start on these road projects, we were unable because no bill um, was brought all the way through and signed through. So we don't get that funding. And so I think oftentimes we see here in rural Minnesota, uh, we get behind um, because there is more funding, sometimes going to different metro projects. I think we need to make sure that we are being strong advocates of our community not only by saying we need, um, it is an absolute necessity that we have a tax and bonding bill uh, at the end of our sessions, um, because that also goes into play with our public education system. Um, public education is a huge driver um, of a strong economy here, uh, kind of in rural Minnesota. And so we need to make sure that we're electing people um, who are going to come in the middle uh, to make sure that these bills are being passed year and year, session after session. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. I really, I really appreciate this question. Uh, Crow Wing County is 75% service-based industry. We are looking across the state and seeing companies like Medtronic reorganizing in Germany. We're seeing companies like Uline move across the border into Wisconsin. We're seeing Polaris build a new facility down in the south. There's a reason for that. Minnesota state sales tax or state tax collections per capita is four thousand two hundred and sixty-seven dollars. That's per man, woman, and child. That's a tax we collect. In Wisconsin, similar state. I'm not saying we're Wisconsin, but it's amazing. Their state collections per capita, two thousand eight hundred and fifty-seven dollars. Iowa, two thousand six hundred and seventy-five. And just for comparison, because we see so many of our folks uh, taking their finances to Florida, they're at $1,800 per capita. Our tax structure here in Minnesota is terrible and has to be reformed. I championed tax cuts for veterans. I carried the veterans temp pension exemption. That's encouraging people that are leaders in the military, folks that have been there over 18 years, in most cases 20 years, people with skills. That encourages them to come to Minnesota. Minnesota was one of only six states that continued to fully tax veterans' pensions. 
carrying that legislation will allow people to take that money, take those skills to, back to Minnesota, 18,000 currently affected veterans by this bill, and to start businesses, participate in Minnesota's economy. Is that enough? No, we got to do a lot more. Minnesota's taxes and tax code are way too complicated and way too high. Thank you. Any additional comments? If I was elected um, to be the next state representative, I would want to continue a lot of the work that we've done right here in the city of Baxter. Uh, for the last four consecutive years, uh, Baxter, uh, in particular the finance department, has been awarded one of the highest honors, um, the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And that was done by a nonpartisan group, the Government Finance Officers Association. And so um, together as a group, um, as a great team, we have great staff, we have uh, great council members that I serve with and department heads and mayors. I would want to bring how are we able um, to keep our funds down? How are we able to give comprehensive financial reporting to our citizens, um, to local business owners, to remain uh, one of the uh, fastest growing uh, cities here in rural Minnesota? Thank you. Mr. Heinzman. Yes, thank you. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect. And as a small business guy, part of the reason I got involved in politics is because of folks that have never actually created a job going to St. Paul and trying to tell me how to better run my business. It's so frustrating to see politicians making decisions for business and they don't understand the impacts. Uh, it's a nice idea, and in some cases, there needs to be wage changes, but raising minimum wage created a lot of problems right here locally in Crow Wing County. When you go to Applebee's and you see a little box on each table that allows you to order menu items, there's a reason for that. They're getting ready as time goes on. If they have to, in order to maintain a profit margin, they have to be able to figure out a way to stay in business. That may mean, and it has meant in lots of other cases, that jobs are lost because they're not able to support those raise incre those uh, wage increases. I'd like to use my minute. Sure. I'd like to respond, because um, this is now the second time this week uh, uh, that Josh has referenced um, that it's a frustration of his when uh, people are elected officials who've never created a job. Uh, I was raised by a small business owner in Brainerd. Um, I saw the small margins that uh, he worked off of it. I saw how he had to sell his business because the margins got smaller. But I also think to diminish somebody's qualifications based on have they hired somebody, um, there are a lot of jobs and a lot of experience that somebody can bring um, to the role of an elected official. I think my 20 years of diabetes advocacy work and raising tens of thousands of dollars for a cause that is underfunded, um, I think showed a strong skill set and I should not be disqualified because I've not hired an individual. Okay, thank you. Our next question is comes from Heidi Holton and it will be directed towards Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> Minnesota Power and Xcel Energy are the state's two biggest utilities and they are taking seriously renewable energy goals um, by installing wind and solar energy systems. So what is your vision for our energy future? I should mention uh, for folks that are wondering, well, why are they leading the way that they have been leading uh, on that particular issue? And in some folks' opinions, it is leadership. Um, but I should mention that part of the causation for that is a mandate from the state of Minnesota requiring that renewables take the place of baseload power over the next 25 years. There may be some wisdom to that, and I'm one of those few people, I don't know if there's others here tonight, I don't assume anything, but I've lived on solar power while visiting uh, my wife's aunt and uncle in Alaska. And it's tricky, it is not easy to do that. There's certain days you can wash clothes and certain days you can't. Certain days that you can run power tools and other days that you know is gonna be a low power day depending on what's happening with the sun. There very well may be a great place for renewable and for other sources of power. I'm not disputing that. I'm saying we're watching as there are significant hikes in costs of power and folks call and wonder why and, 
And it's sometimes, in some people's mind, a complicated issue. It's really not. The state has to be very careful, and I oppose mandating and requiring companies to make these kinds of choices without considering the impacts across the entire state. There is an impact, and we have to have base load power available for industry. And here again, it falls back to a business issue that is, this is often overlooked. We have companies across the entire state that depend on that power. And in some cases, with a small margin of profit, a small margin where they can actually maintain their business here in Minnesota, they're looking potentially elsewhere if we don't continue to have that base load power available. Thank you, Ms. Nystrom. Mm -mm. Yeah, I uh, was lucky to be able to attend. Uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a, a candidate forum informational session held at the Brainerd Library uh, by a local organization uh, here in town uh, called Real and also by the Minnesota uh, Environmental Partnership. And um, they both spoke about actually the billions of dollars that are going outside of our state um, to have us put money into fossil fuel. Uh, what is our reliance on fossil fuel here in the state of Minnesota? And so uh, Jay Edens, who's a gentleman who started Real and um, has done incredible work in this area of looking at what are different sources of energy? How can we lower our reliance um, on fossil fuels. And um, he spoke about a great project uh, that they did here locally with low-income housing, with solar panels on the roofs. Uh, they looked at how can they actually create more jobs by looking at this kind of renewable energy. And so, you know, I think it's a twofold thing. One, looking at ways, um, you know, I think we've been able to improve uh, the type of panels that we're putting on. I think we've seen growth, uh, tremendous growth in that area just in the last three years. But I think it's also talking about how can we lower our reliance, um, even uh, you know, looking at uh, hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles, um, instead of continuing to have a high reliance um, on these fuels that are actually costing our state uh, billions of dollars every year as they go outside to other states. Thank you. Mr. Heinzman, any response there? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, I ran out of time over at, during the last opportunity and I'm going to fill in. Uh, one of the things that complicates uh, the, a, a transition, if there is a transition to be made, is propping up some of uh, these sources for energy. And specifically, uh, something that's known as net metering. Um, we force power companies in Minnesota to purchase power off of a solar grid back not at the wholesale cost that they would purchase baseload power, but at retail. In order for this, in order for there to be a transition, if there is, and there likely is as technology improves, it has to make fiscal sense. It has to sustain itself on its own. It can't have folks constantly propping it up. And in the national media, you remember stories about companies that made bad choices. We need to make good ones. Nystrom, would you like a response? Um, you know, I think uh, looking at uh, creative solutions uh, like organizations like Real, uh, like some of these environmental partnerships I've gotten to talk to, uh, you know, it's one of those things where we pay, we pay now or we end up paying more later. And so I think we want to look at these areas where we can invest money uh, that will actually, in the long run, pay for themselves. And I know a lot of those solutions that were presented to us at that candidate forum uh, would do that um, as long as we uh, continue to invest and look at those areas that we can be in. Thank you. Our next question comes from Zach Kaiser, and he will be addressing that to Ms. Nystrom. <clears throat> What's the most important issue facing women in Minnesota today, and what can the state do to address it? You know, uh, in 2016, I think it's... Uh, still difficult. Uh, we see a large wage gap uh, with women. Um, you know, I think that's first and foremost. Uh, you know, as I'm knocking on doors, a lot of women will say, um, you know, I make 76 cents to the dollar uh, that a male colleague of mine would make. Um, and I think that we, you know, we often think of these big, large issues of what are people struggling with or what do we see on the media. Um, but the reality is, is that a person who shows up at a job, does a great job, 
uh, regardless of what their gender is, should be paid the same amount um, for what your skill set is, what your background is, what your education is, what your experience is in. I, I think the other thing is, um, and I see this a lot, I, I think we still struggle sometimes with sexism. Um, I think sometimes there is a double standard that we'll see. Um, I think um, I caught a little bit of the last um, uh, debate uh, with our current Senator, Carrie Rood. She talked about her important work that she's been doing nationally uh, with women who want to run for political office. I know that when I initially looked at running uh, for the Baxter City Council, one of the reasons that motivated me to do that was that uh, the government that I saw wasn't representing the population. There were no women serving on the city council in Baxter. And so it was important for me to want to be a role model for other young women and young girls to say it doesn't matter uh, what gender you are, how old you are, if you put your mind to it, you work hard, um, and you're a good listener, um, you can do whatever you set your mind to. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> I mentioned this earlier, and uh, I'll bring it up again. I have three daughters, Jane, Elizabeth, and Kelly. And uh, they range in age from five to 13. I want them to be able to go anywhere they want to go and accomplish anything that they want to accomplish. The question was, what do I think is one of the greatest challenges, if not the greatest challenge, uh, facing my daughters? And uh, quite honestly, it's a world that is bombarding them with images and pressure, whether it be in media, social media, or other, uh, of what they should be as a woman. And I really want them to be able to navigate that path without that kind of uh, noise defining them. I want them to be able to define themselves and to be able to accomplish their goals uh, without that pressure. And I certainly hope that as a father, as a dad, that I can enable them and encourage them, and as a state representative, enact legislation if necessary to help them on that path. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nystrom, any additional comments? One of the best parts um, about running for this office has been getting to meet a lot of young girls um, who either I knew their parents or uh, they grew up in the neighborhood next door to me. And um, after the homecoming parade, actually this last Saturday, um, there were a bunch of young girls who had come up to me after the parade. And uh, they asked me, uh, do you have a t-shirt? We want to take a picture of you. We realize Quinn is a girl. <laughs> and um, I think for them as young girls, they haven't seen a lot of um, women in roles of elected office. And so to even see um, a young woman like myself walk in a parade and have their parents say, oh, she's running for the Minnesota House, it means something to these young girls. And um, it's been an honor to be able to uh, get to meet them, to get to know them, um, to have them send me messages on Facebook after the parade uh, with their t-shirts on um, and knowing uh, that I can say, have a strong voice, um, and you can do anything you set your mind to. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> I really think that was well said and great point. I appreciate that story. And um, I'll share uh, kind of something that is near and dear to my heart on this one. Um, while we were trying to decide, or I should say it like this, I should say ultimately our family decided that if we were going to do this job, if we were going to go to St. Paul, we were going to do it as a family. And so Carrie and the kids move down with me to St. Paul so that when I get home at night, they're right there and I get to be with my, my daughters and my sons. And to see my, my kids walking into the Capitol and all the other folks that are there and uh, specifically the women, they love that, love seeing these powerful, strong, independent people, women, taking on this responsibility and this role, legislating and uh, working with constituents. It was a beautiful thing. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Wyman has our next question. He will direct that to Mr. Hensman. What is your plan for a long-term transportation fix for our roads and bridges? And would a gas tax increase be part of the funding mechanism? 
Really appreciate that question. That's been a conversation over the last two years that has uh, garnered a lot of attention, which it deserves. Uh, my opponent had brought up some comments, some uh, issues specifically in regard to the bonding bill and uh, that it was a disappointment that it wasn't passed. I agree. I carried the legislation that would have improved Cypress Drive in Baxter. Um, there's been some confusion on that, that it might have impacted other parts of the city. That's not the case. It was Cypress Drive specifically. And I championed that, worked hard on that, and it was included in the bonding bill. And it was held up because our governor, Governor Dayton, would not allow that bonding bill to move forward because he wanted Southwest Light Rail. And just real quick, I'm going to explain it to you folks. We subsidize every ticket on the North Star Line by $22. That doesn't matter where you get on, doesn't matter where you get off. $22, that's $44 a day. And if you commute five days a week, like you might for a normal job, that's $900 a month. I could lease you a Mercedes and pay the gas for the same price. It doesn't make sense. Why would the governor ever think to do that and then try and blame Republicans? Maybe that was the goal, to try and win some political points at the cost of projects across greater Minnesota. In regard to a gas tax, absolutely not. It's off the table. And the reason is, is because as I'm talking to folks all across this district, they're saying, are you kidding me? We're already paying a very significant cost making, to make an investment into transportation. The other part of the reason I don't support a gas tax is because we have declining gas revenues. And that's because of more efficient vehicles. That's awesome. That's great. But we should be diverting sales tax from uh, tires and from auto parts and other sources back to roads and bridges so folks that are using electric vehicle or more efficient vehicles continue to kick in and pay their fair share. Thank you. Ms. Nystrom. Well, I don't believe that we can blame um, just a single person on not having the bonding bill uh, pass this year. Um, to me, uh, we have a Senate and a House and a governor for checks and balances. And uh, to me, on both sides of the aisle, um, the governor is included in that, but he's certainly not the sole reason. Uh, we did not get a tax or bonding bill, uh, though I appreciate our area representatives uh, for including the Cypress uh, Drive project, which uh, you know I know very well sitting on the Baxter City Council. Ultimately, uh, we didn't have a bonding bill. There was no special session. And so uh, to me, we need to ensure that our local roads and bridges are kept up. And part of that is the state funding that we would receive. In a rural Minnesota, we get farther and farther behind, especially uh, when these bills don't get passed because the construction projects are delayed, uh, which just leads to increased construction costs um, as each year goes on. Um, I'm actually in favor of a gas tax as a way to look at funding our roads and bridges. Uh, I attended uh, an event, I believe, uh, Representative Heinzman was there as well this last spring uh, that was held by the Brainerd Chamber and it was an eggs and issues event and they were doing a little live polling and um, actually a majority uh, of the people in that room and again it was a small sample uh, didn't think it was a bad idea to look at a gas tax and so to me even though we are looking at uh, more energy efficient vehicles I think we have to look at the people who are using the roads in a way that we can uh, creatively fund these projects. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> yeah, just to be clear, the only person in the state that can call a special session is the governor, and he didn't. Because he demanded that in order that he would even consider that, that light rail would be on the table. Light rail is a boondoggle from the start. In previous debates, I've seen the numbers challenge, but it is a fact the state put money into researching this, 37% of the folks that actually use light rail transportation don't pay. They walk on the train, they walk off. We gotta consider the needs of greater Minnesota and not try to make political points. And just to be clear, the governor was the one man that could have come to the table and worked on this issue and brought those bills forward in a meaningful way. $800 million in tax relief and a bonding bill chock full of excellent projects across the entire state of Minnesota, infrastructure projects that we needed. Thank you. Well, uh, 
I think the point needs to be made that the Southwest Light Rail uh, Transit, as part of that bill, uh, actually was about giving the area where that light rail would be local control. In the city of Baxter, if somebody said to me, we want you to pay for um, you know, a civic center project we have or the U.S. Bank Stadium, um, I wouldn't be okay with that. Um, but as part of that bonding bill, the Southwest Light Rail uh, was only giving the option for it to be local control, to let that community decide, to let that um, council decide and discuss it on a local area. Um, I think when we looked at the special session again, I think it came down to partisan bickering because um, the Speaker of the House, he wanted school vouchers put on the table. Um, so, you know, I, I read that in an article that he was quoted as saying that. And so I think, again, I think all sides are to blame and we need to send more people down who are willing to work on all sides of the aisle. Thank you. That concludes the question portion of our program tonight. Went fast, didn't it? We would like to now uh, give you both an opportunity to, to have a two-minute closing comments, and we'll start with you, Ms. Nystrom. Well, it's been a real honor for me um, to be raised in the Brainerd Lakes area community. While I've been out door knocking and attending different events, I've gotten to reconnect with a lot of my um, school teachers, uh, with a lot of my principals, uh, with old Sunday school teachers of mine. I have a 20-year history of working on all sides of the aisle, uh, Republicans, Independents, Democrats, um, and that's probably because I was raised by a family who has 100 years of service um, as uh, nonpartisan. And so to me, it's about finding solutions. It's about being a problem solver. Um, it's not about being partisan. It's about figuring out how can we continue to move our community forward, um, about bringing a strong voice, um, about being a community representative. Um, I think about constituent services, um, about being somebody that people uh, will call or email when they have a problem. You know, sitting on the Baxter City Council, um, it's been a privilege to be able to meet with people to figure out what are different issues uh, that they have. Um, at the end of the day, um, if I was to be elected, my constituents uh, are my bosses. They are the ones who've elected me to serve for them, to be a representative for them, for this community. Um, I want to be a strong advocate of our public education system here where we have uh, roughly 8,100 uh, students in both of our school systems. I want to be a champion of uh, a safe uh, local infrastructure. I want to be a champion of affordable health care. Um, and so I would appreciate your support and your vote on November 8th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Heinzman. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank the viewers at home. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Thank you to Lakeland Public Television and the other supporters that are here today that made this event happen. One of the hard realities that I've learned over the last two years is the incredible divide between Minneapolis Democrat, between Minneapolis Democrat leadership and our priorities here in the Lakes area. Across greater Minnesota, the Democrat strategy has been to run moderate candidates that when elected allow them to control the Senate and even the House. Those majorities have given them power to pass some lousy legislation creating the disastrous Minsure Exchange, build and expand light rail, and raise taxes over the last biennium, previous to my opportunity to serve, by almost, well actually over $2 billion. I have to ask, when was the last time you saw DFL leadership proposing and passing legislation to protect the unborn, restore or enhance your Second Amendment rights, or cut taxes? The answer is never. And recently, they've done exactly the opposite, forcing businesses and families to take their money and resources to other states. I've protected your Second Amendment rights, fought for the unborn, cut taxes, lowered college tuition, and funded our schools. I've stood against those that are continually trying to tell you how to raise your family and with what values. I may be only eight years older than my opponent, but I've been very busy. I've helped build a successful family business, working with contractors and clients over the last 20 years, been married to my wife Carrie for 17 years. We're raising six children together. 
I've learned a lot of life's hard lessons, and I'd be honored to continue to fight for your priorities in St. Paul, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you to both of our candidates for taking the time out to share your opinions with our viewers. We appreciate it very much. That concludes this debate. If uh, you missed it or a portion of it or know someone who's missed a portion of it, it will be posted in 24 hours on lptv.org. You can also pick up the uh, probably the Monday morning dispatch for a recap, and you can also go to the Brainerd Dispatch website at brainerddispatch.com, and you can also get an audio portion of this by going to kaxe.com. Our next debate will be in just a few minutes at 9 o'clock, and it will feature the House District 10 candidates Aaron Wagner and Dale Lewick. Thank you and good evening.